when you start meditating, make a survey of the body as you feel it from within. You can start with the tips of the fingers and the tips of the toes and work on up to the head, or start with the head and go down the body. This is the territory you're going to try to inhabit right now, the body as you feel it from within, focusing particularly on the breath energy as it flows in the body. When you breathe in, where do you feel the breath? And what does the breath feel like? Here we're not talking just about the air coming in and out of the nose, but the sense of energy flow in the body. Where does that energy flow start? And how does it move the body? Does it feel good? Or does it feel tight and constricted in some parts? Wherever it feels tight and constricted, think of loosening it up. And try to keep your mind right in this territory. Outside of this territory right now, <clears throat> the Buddha said that's the, the realm of Mara. And this is your realm right now. Try to get to know this realm really well. Any thoughts that go outside, just tell yourself, not this time, not right now. Maybe later, because the mind will keep churning out thoughts for a bit, and some of them will be useful and some of them will not be useful, but anything that's not related to the sense of the body, as you feel it from within right now, is not in line with the duty that you've set aside for this time and this place. You're trying to train the mind. Why is that? Because the mind, when it's untrained, can cause a lot of suffering. There's a passage where the Buddha says that we gain our conviction in the path from the fact of suffering. He goes through the different stages in the series of dependent core rising, from ignorance all the way up to suffering, stress. And then he moves on. He says, from suffering and stress comes conviction. How is that? Well, our normal response to suffering is one of two things. Either we're bewildered by it, or we look for someone who can teach us a way out of it. And we've tried lots of different ways and listened to lots of different people. And the most hopeless ones, of course, are the ones that say, well, suffering is something that can't be solved, or I've got to depend on somebody else. And finally get around to the idea, well, maybe it's something we can do something about ourselves. Maybe we have it within us to put an end to the suffering. That's the beginning of conviction, because conviction here means conviction in the Buddha's awakening. And what does that mean for us? It means that a human being has found the way to put an end to suffering and taught it. And it's worked for a couple of thousands of years. And so maybe it might work for us, so we're willing to give it a chance. That's why we had that chant at the beginning. Subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death, subject to separation. All of us are pretty miserable. But then we have our actions, and it's through our actions that we can find the way out. And where do our actions come from? They come from the mind. So we've got to train the mind. And this emphasis on suffering is there to keep reminding us there's work to be done. We're here meditating because there's things that need to be done in the mind. If we don't do them, the mind's just going to go for its old ways. It's not that the Buddha did not recognize that there is pleasure in life. At the five aggregates, he said, all give pleasure, but he said, that's why we're attached to them. And when we're attached to them, they trap us. And he's trying to teach us freedom. So he says, when you focus on the fact that these things do carry stress and suffering, that leads you to freedom. So when the Buddha teaches us to focus on how 
say, the aggregates or the sense media, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, ideas, are all in constant, stressful, not self. It's not just to stay with those negative realizations. They're there to make us look at the things that we're attached to and to ask ourselves, what do you think we're getting out of them? There is pleasure, but is it worth it? And when you see that it's not worth it, then you can let go. And when you let go, you let go of everything, even those perceptions of it, in constancy, stress, not self. Those are perceptions, one of the aggregates. They do their duty, and then you put them aside. After all, we're not here just to arrive at a truth about things. The Buddha talks about truth in many ways. The truth is something you tell, and it's also a quality of the character. You're truthful in sticking to a task that you've set your mind to, or truthful in keeping a promise. The truth is also something you safeguard. When you say something, you want to be clear about whether you're saying it because you know it, or because you've heard it, or because you think it makes, se makes sense. And then truth is something you awaken to by finding somebody reliable, listening to that person, putting that person's teachings into practice. And you finally awaken to the fact that there is freedom. And then the truths that you use, the Buddha said, those are things that you escape from, and that you transcend. So we're not here just to arrive at the conclusion that, yes, the aggregates are stressful, because as the Buddha points out, they do have their positive side, their pleasant side. But if you focus on the pleasant side, you're going to stay trapped. If you focus on the negative side, but in an unskillful way, you get trapped there too. We use these teachings, all of his teachings, as the Buddha said, they're a raft to take us to freedom. And so in this case, insight is a value judgment. Are these things worth holding on to? And you want to get the mind to a point where it says no. But to get there, you've got to train it. Because no matter how much you might explain things to yourself about how this attachment is bad or that attachment is bad, if you don't give the mind something good to hold on to in the meantime, it's going to go back to its old attachments. And it's going to say, well, it may not be perfect, but it's good enough for me. And one of the reasons we try to get the mind into concentration and learn how to inhabit this sense of the body from within in a way that gives rise to ease, a sense of well-being, a sense of really belonging here, because it puts us in a better position to make better value judgments. We've got something better to compare things to, the pleasure that comes from lust, the pleasure that comes from anger. The pleasure that comes from holding on to your ideas. You learn to see, oh yeah, there is some pleasure there, but there are also a lot of drawbacks. And if you can develop a sense of well-being by the way you breathe, by the way you allow the breath energy to flow through the body, so that body, feeling of pleasure, and awareness all seem to become one, that puts you in a better position to make better judgments as to what's worth holding on to or what's not. You hold on to this in the meantime, and you actually try to make this as pleasant and as constant and as much your own as possible. You're fighting against those three characteristics. So when other things come up, it's very obvious how inconstant, stressful, and not self they are. And only when you've done a thorough job at looking at all your other attachments, then, then you take this one apart. Use those same three perceptions. See that even the concentration state is, involves aggregates. There's the aggregate of form, your breath, your sense of the body as you feel it right now, the feeling, the feeling of pleasure, 
perception, the perception of breath, or the perception of, as the sense of the body begins to dissolve away, the sense of space that permeates the body and then spreads out. And it seems like the skin turns into just little dots of sensation. So there's no clear boundary between space inside and space outside. Or the sense of awareness that knows all these things. All these things are perceptions. And there's a fabrication, the directed thought and evaluation, and there's awareness of all these things. All these things are aggregates, and they too are in constant stressful and not self. And when the mind is really ready, it can, it can let go of all these things, and then it lets go of those perceptions too. So awakening to the truth involves transcending or escaping from truth into freedom, which is what this is all about. And this is how we start with our realization of stress and through the development of conviction that there's got to be a way out, and this is it. We develop our heedfulness, we develop our sense of well-being that comes from following the path. We hold on to the path as long as we need it. And then all aspects of the path, virtue, concentration, discernment, finally let, we let those go too. This is the purpose of everything the Buddha taught. So we're not here just to be mired in aging, illness, and death. So it's in constant stress on that self, trying to latch on to these things and squeeze what little pleasure we can out of them. We have to realize there's something better. This is why we need conviction, because we are going someplace we haven't been before. As the Buddha said, we're coming to, trying to see what we haven't seen yet, to realize what we haven't realized yet, to attain what we haven't attained yet. We're going someplace we haven't been before. Although when we arrive, there's a sense that, okay, it's always been there. We've been too busy, however, ignoring it. We ignore it because we're interested in other things, attached to other things. And only when we can let go of that attachment can we find the freedom that's there. That's what this is all about.